On today's episode of Kilts and Culture with USA Kilts, we try Glenfiddich Fire and Cane. Mm. Fire! Wah, wah, wah! I teach you to drink! Yeah! Wah, wah, wah. Welcome to Kilts and Culture. I am Rocky. This is Eric. Victorian England had a huge influence on the fashions and styles that were happening in Highland dress in Scotland. Tartan is Scotland's gift to the world and it is your personal heritage story. Howdy boys and girls, welcome to Kilts and Culture. I am Rocky, this is Eric. Yep. Today, we were supposed to have Jamesy on the show. It's a weird <laughs> setup. So I'm gonna give you a brief explanation right up front. Um, essentially, my kid got COVID and we tested him last night. I am fine, I feel fine, no symptoms. However, out of an abundance of caution, I decided we wanted to call Jamesy from Albanac, who was supposed to be our guest host, and he has a bunch of tours. He's gonna be in front of a lot of people. I didn't wanna even have any remote chance of infecting him. So we rescheduled that. We're gonna be doing him on the show in a future show. Out of an abundance of caution for Eric and Mac and Jamie, who are physically in the room right next to me, Yep. Um, I'm actually recording outside the studio room. This is our beautiful marketing department. Well, it's our ska-esque walls. From yeah, specifically, that's like, that's like my office area right there. Yep. The, that, all the stupid books and the globe and stuff, that's all my nesting. Surrounded Indeed. by trivia. Makes me feel better. Makes me feel safe. Indeed. Yep. So, special treat for today's show. We are drinking Glenfiddich Fire and Cane. This mm. is given to us by friend of the show, Jonathan King. So thank you very much, Jonathan, um, for, you know, precautions. We actually pre-poured the whiskey this time. So Mac and uh, Eric in there have their glasses poured already. Um, we normally do with this segment uh, what tartans we're wearing as well while Mac goes to collect his scotch. So Eric, Mac, what tartan are you guys wearing today? Are we going in typical order, normal order here? <laughs> I, I don't know. He, he put you first. I don't know. A, it's yeah. hey, hey, everything else. Hey, oh. all he is. All he is. All right. Well, then I'll I'll go first. Uh, I've I've got the uh, county down on today. Mm. Very lovely. Cool. Cool. Kilts and culture. Awesome. I am wearing the Royal Stewart weathered tartan myself. So, all right. Enough of that. Let's get to drinking. <laughs> all right, who has the, the tasting notes and sniffing notes and all that stuff for the Glenfiddich Fire and Cane in there? I, I have them over here. Okay. Um, so this is saying the Fire and Cane is a bold fusion of smoky and sweet note with a marrying peat, peated whiskey and malts matured in bourbon barrels then finished in Latin rum casks. Um, hmm. That's interesting. So it is golden in color, which I would tend to agree with them on that. Yep. Um, so do you want do you want the nose notes first, or do you want to or do you want to? Uh, we'll 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 smell a little bit. We'll see what we smell first. All right, Mr. Eric, um, Mr. Mac, do you have any uh, sense in mind? Do we have any sense? Do you have <laughs> no. any sense at all? <laughs> we have no sense whatsoever. <laughs> I'm definitely getting a little bit of smoke. It's not overpowered. I, well, I'm, get, I'm getting a fair amount of smoke. Yeah. It's not overpowered. It's like light smoke. It's, yeah. It's the beginning of kindling. It's, you know. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I know their notes, so. I, I, I saw it on the screen, too, unfortunately. Uh, it's like leading the witness yeah, here. I'm okay. To... I can't see that far. <laughs> okay. So their, their notes are saying a billowing soft peat notes like a distant smoke. On the wind. So there you go. There's your... There's Holy schnuckies, I was right, kind of. Rich, sweet toffee with zesty fruit, fresh fruit notes, and spiciness. It's a spicy. Yes, it's a spicy whiskey. Um, <laughs> the, I don't get toffee on the nose, but... I'm not getting toffee. Yeah. All right. Well, let's see what tastes. <laughs> <You're> yeah. <okay? laughs> uh, we we poured a little one for Jamie as well, so she's back there. Oh yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it's yeah, it's it's light. It's not it's not it, it, the smoke is there, the peat is there, but it's kind of light, real Her real short in the in the mouth. Too. Yeah, and sweet. 
Yeah. Little bit of like the, the seaweedy kind of taste, a little bit of iodine, just a, a hint. <clears throat> I was going to say a fair amount of iodine, in my opinion, but. Okay. And it's funny because the smokiness is like, they wouldn't like me to describe it for them because it's like, when you've tried to start a campfire and your kindling doesn't take. Yep. Because the wood's wet and you get a billow of smoke in your face and you choke to death. That's the kind of smokiness. You know, so, like. so would you say it, it tastes like a Highland Peak campfire? With oak notes and toffee <laughs> and and sharp green fruit. Not red oh, fruit. God. Green fruit. Sweet baked apple on oh. soft smoke. I can really taste the kumquat. <laughs> <laughs> green fruit. Some, and now somebody out there gonna tell us what green fruit means. <laughs> Honeydew, melon, uh, something like that. Um all the immature fruits. Yes. <laughs> I don't get a lot of the. I don't get a lot of the toffee. I'm mostly getting band aid, dude. Yeah, I'm tasting band aid. Jamie's. I'm not. I'm not alone. Jamie's nodding her head. I was like, tastes like just tastes like band aid <clears throat> to me. To me, it's nowhere near as much as like a, a Lafroig or a Lagavulin as far as the band aid, the iodine kind of note. I think we've had a. We haven't had a PD one in a while. I think that's part of my problem. You know, Fair. the penis and the smoking are getting. Now it's funny because I looked at some of the reviews other people were leaving on this one. And they were saying about how smoky it is. I think I don't. I don't think it's like. It's not like heavy. Like <clears throat> I think it's lighter I, on yes, the smoke. I, I I don't know. I think it's pretty smoky. So. I will say for a Glenfiddich, it is smoky. For an for an Isla okay. or for something that says like we're smoky, it's not. It's 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 a it's a mellow smoke. It's there, gotcha. but it's it's mellow. Okay. To me, mellow. Who am I? What it's toasted. Yeah. It's all those green fruits in there. Yeah. Mm. Uh, some I, I just want to hear one scotch that just like slips it in there like green vegetables. <laughs> Tastes like peas. Asparagus. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm Seaweed. stopping. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. All right. Not bad. Mac, how are you feeling about it? I think it's... I expected a little bit more, I guess, because I read some of the reviews. So I had a little bit more expectation on it, and it's just not quite as where I thought it was going to end up. Okay. Um, so I should not read those beforehand anymore. <laughs> I added a touch of water just to see if that if that cut down on the uh, the smoke a little bit for me. Say that would. Yeah. I don't think so. It's not really peppery. I did, but I didn't oh, get did. much pepper on it. No, I expected more. A little bit more bite behind it. Mm -hmm. Water there's didn't. A little, there's a little. I get. I get the pepperiness on the end. On the back end, I get the pepperiness. But... Well, they're saying that the finish is lingering smokiness and sweetness. No. But a lot of the other reviews I was seeing were a lot of people were saying they weren't getting the sweet out of it like. Is being said. Yeah, I got the sweet like right on the first time I tried it, and since since then I just have not been picking up on it yeah. at all. Maybe maybe a touch. It, it's it's not toffee. I love toffee. It's not toffee, um, but maybe a touch of sweetness lingering, like you were saying. Um, take a sip and then just like let it sit for a sec. You know, swallow it and let it sit for a sec. Yeah, a little, a little, yeah, not yeah, a ton. No, it's very quick. That, yeah, hmm. it's a short finish. It's it's very yeah. yeah. Jamie, okay. The band aid was the <laughs> best. That's sad for it. It's mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Mac, score it one to ten. What do you give it? I'm going five one. I'm going right down the middle. That okay. low. I'm not. I'm not. Okay. It. It. Again, I read the. Re, I read other reviews, so I. My expectation was a lot higher, and mm -hmm. it didn't meet mm -hmm. that. So, I can't read reviews <laughs> beforehand yes. anymore. Yeah. Fair. So bias witness. Yeah. yeah. Eric. Three point nine. I don't like it. I really do not like it. Oh, you guys are harsh. Sorry. <laughs> not, you guys are harsh. Not my jam. Um. I'm going. 
Seven four. Good. I like it. Um, okay. I wouldn't. I wouldn't drive a ways to get it. But if someone said, you know, hey, here's a bottle of scotch. My name's Jonathan King. Why don't you try this? I would absolutely take another. Yeah. Um, if, if this was just sitting out and it just it would be just. <laughs> but no, like if if it's like you go somewhere and you have like this would be I think an all around just like good just to have yeah. around type yeah. thing. Nothing. It's, Nothing to knock your socks <clears throat> off, but nothing to really okay. go the other direction on either. Yeah, I don't really like it. I would have to pair it with something to make it more fun to drink. Fair. I don't know. Very good. All right. That's our score. I like it. They hate it. <laughs> All right. Boys and girls, I if think, you could. Hang it. Wait, wait, wait. I want Jamie every time to, like, just give us a thumbs up or thumbs down. No no vote. Just, like, get her get her thumb on the, on the max camera and just go... You know, or sideways, yeah. or sideways One, even. Two, yeah. Yep. Is, is this Sparta? Yeah. Yeah. Does Did it you... does it die? <laughs> Did you know that's reversed? <laughs> uh yeah. There you go. In ancient Rome, it was actually thumbs up meant kill them, and thumbs down meant don't kill them. But we, it was counterintuitive to people hmm. since then, so they we reversed it. But historically, hmm. like yeah, go for it. Cut his head off. You know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, boys and girls. Load in questions, whatever you have for us, please put them in the comments. As always, we are your humble servants here to answer whatever kilt and culture related questions that you have. Unless it's about Albanac because we're still crying in our beer about yep. that. So <laughs> what we'll get Scotch. him some other time. Indeed. Yeah, don't worry. We will have Jamesy back. We actually had a full, a full, full day. We didn't know how we we're going to get it all done anyway. Yeah. <laughs> we had a very full day planned of, you know, me sitting down, and interview him, do a bunch of different stuff for TikTok, doing a bunch of stuff. You know, for the show, we had everything planned. Yeah, thank you, COVID. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Eric, what do we got, Mr. For Rocky? One of our preloaded questions. Okay, I'm going to start with that with a, a somewhat amusing one. Um, Don Wilbur wrote to us and said, "Since COVID, I've been avoiding barbers, and my hair is now at uh, shoulder length. Is this appropriate?" I've noticed both Rocky and Eric keep their hair fairly close to the skin, and I don't want to be culturally insensitive. Uh, I'm a Hamilton and 72 years old, by the way, but I feel a lot younger than that. So, <coughs> the is long hair inappropriate for Highland dress or representing Celtic culture? He is being culturally insensitive to the follically challenged. Oh, oh, my eye. The, uh, um, yeah, I. <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's it's culturally inappropriate or not. It's just it's a hairstyle. Um, you know, it, just like anything goes in and out of fashion. So uh, our hairstyle is not a choice necessarily. Yeah. It's kind of what God graced us with, not upon our birth, but mm -hmm. at least me, mid twenties. Yep. Um yep. <clears throat> so it's not really a choice. If I grew my hair out, it would be a skullet and nobody wants to see that. <laughs> um That's a Celtic tonsure. That's actually very very traditional Irish. You know, you look like a pre-Roman church uh, monk. Uh, I'm, all, I'm all set. Okay. The, uh, so, no, it's for us, it is not a fashion thing. I'm not that fashionable. It's just a, it's, it's low maintenance, frankly. Um, Where is that? Would you, you know, should you wear, you know, long hair? Sure. Ian, our store manager, has long hair. He yeah. rocks it all the time. You know, half the time he has it, you know, pulled back just out of his face. You know, the other half the time he looks like, you know, a, a, a Celtic Jesus. So it's whatever whatever you want to do with your hair. Keep it together, Mac. <laughs> um, yeah, I agree. I mean, basically, uh, we talk about how Highland dress is very traditional. It is designed to be traditional. Therefore, its trends change very slowly. Uh, but it always leaves room for whatever the current fashions of the time are, which is why you have different jackets and things changing over, over the years, you know, like the lapels getting wider or skinnier and, and the invention of the Prince Charlie, our favorite example, which doesn't pr date back earlier than like the 1920s with those jazz age peak lapels on it. Hairstyles are not affected by Highland dress that you, if you look at pictures of guys from the seventies, they're going to have 70 style hair, you know, with their traditional timeless, almost 19th century looking formal Highland dress. So long hair is fine. I would only argue that if you're trying to look more gentlemanly for a special occasion, I would consider tying it back. Be the sensitive ponytail guy. 
um, for the special occasion. Um, now, if you if you're really good at keeping it very clean and 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 lustrous, unlike my son, um, then uh, then sure, maybe you could wear it long for a special occasion. But uh, I would I would just say you know if you want to make sure the lines are clean and crisp for when you want to look nice, I would just tie it back, do the ponytail thing. That's my and that's what Ian does. Yeah, I think. That's just don't seen. do the man bun thing. Ponytail, fine. Man bun, nah. 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 You're not a samurai. You don't need to do the T-Whisk style. That's what they call you that. Are. You ever see Toshiro Mifune in the samurai movies? With the no. tight, The tight hair, and it's like a pom-pom on the back. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's called a T-Whisk style. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah, don't do that. Don't do no. that. Indeed. Cheers. All right, Mr. Mac, do we have anyone out there in the interwebs? We do. We've got a few people out here... Uh... Rattling off some questions. I mean, Kirk has a has a, a really in depth one that he's looking for Rocky to answer. Oh, Kirk. He'd like to know where babies come from, Rocky. I don't know if you can help him with that. Who Kirk? let him in? <laughs> when a mommy and a daddy really love each other. <laughs> All right. Next. All right. So we have James. Uh, he is he is wondering what was the original tartan the Scottish Highlanders wore. It must have been. Used with colors from plants that was available in the area. Must have been some color variant um, in the Highlands with great kilts. But was wondering what tartan was used. And he's as he's looking to get something like that for himself. He's saying Highlanders specifically. He's saying Scottish Highlanders war. Yes. The <clears throat> No one really knows what the first tartan was. And th frankly, the first tartan probably wasn't in Scotland. Um, the That said... Mills and dye houses in the you know in a particular region would use yes you're correct the local plants to dye the the yarn the wool and make it into specific colors. Um, the tartans kind of originally started out as regional things. It would be just a generic pattern. It didn't you know Moses didn't come down from the mount and say here you go here are the clan tartans you know go forth and be clannish. Um, the, it was it kind of evolved over time. So it was a mill who used specific colors because that's what they could get locally, and then they would weave a pattern or two pattern or whatever they thought was you know commercially viable to weave, and the people who lived in that area would buy from that mill, and that would be the tartan that they would have. Yeah, I think it's a it's an interesting question from a I'd say from an archaeological standpoint. Um, I know that I don't know what. The offhand, what the um, what the exact colors or the vegetable dyes used in the uh, Falkirk tartan are. Uh, the Falkirk tartan, it's not really a tartan, but is the oldest uh, example of tartan fabric. It was basically a uh, um, uh, a remnant uh, of cloth which somebody had wrapped some coins in before burying it, so that the Romans wouldn't get it when they came through to do their ta the tax collection. Um, so I think it's Falkirk. Am I thinking of Falkirk? I think you are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, we'll edit it later if I'm wrong, but I, I would say that you could take an educated guess in terms of like some of the most popular, uh, natural dyes are matter based. Um, there's woad and then there's, um, uh, nut based stuff. And, and I don't know how many nut trees naturally grew in the highlands back in the day. Matter dyes were probably common. Um, and, uh, well, some of, but you don't know what the trade routes brought in. I think I think the Highlands is being relatively isolated and, and limited in terms of the vegetation you could use to create dyes with. So, but I'm imagining it'd probably be something like a rust and a blue uh, base, maybe with some orangish red in it from matter dyes. And Mac was over here nodding his head like he knew something. Did that, that ring no, a bell with you? I was just agreeing with. Oh, you're just those, agreeing with me. Yeah, with the likelihood. With some of the yeah. the dye runs. Yeah, you, yeah. You just don't know what's exactly the trade route could bring anything in. Yeah, and then it becomes a question of what you can afford if you're asking your household, you know, wife or whoever who's doing the, the, the dying to make something with this. Did you have to pay for it or trade for it? Or is it something that really just literally grew outside your yard? Um, I think that, but again, I think matter dyes for like rusts and reds and some yellows, um, if I'm not mistaken, I'd have to ask the wife. Um, and then um, uh, woad for the blue bluish colors bluish green colors but that's an educated guess we'd have to look into it to be sure but yeah no nobody really knows beyond educated guesses i don't think because i don't what's the um yeah we're talking really early then you have to go back past like the the earliest examples of 
extant kilts too, right? Yeah, I'm I'm thinking the other example I had in my head aside from Falkirk would have been like the shepherd's check. Um, yeah. You know, just the, the, the black and white kind of pattern. Yeah. So there's not really color in that so much as black and white. But, but there were, but there were, I've seen versions of shepherd check, which were, again, like a rust tan color and then a, a blue. Okay. So that might, yeah. Yeah. It's Remember, it question. didn't start off with the symbolism that we have in it today. It was just a pattern that people liked and bought. So hope that helps. Mr. Mac, was that you or was that, was that Eric? That was mad. All right, Mr. Eric, what's your next one while I pour some more of this fire and cake? You can have mine. <laughs> okay. All right. This is a this is a kind of another kind of a light one in a sense, but I'm gonna throw it out there because um, every year we get asked about uh, whether it's on the show or in person um, doing kilts and such for Halloween costumes. Tis the season, um, and I think. Most of you who are regular viewers will know what our standard stock opinion on that is. But this, is, this question was kind of similar. So I'm going to throw this out there. Russell Smith said, uh, You've mentioned Star Wars costumes with kilts and tartans in them before. Yes, we have some photos of like that. Um, is it tasteful to use a kilt in cosplay? If so, what are some other genres or characters that could be kilted for a convention? It means like a science fiction convention. Um, I ask this with the utmost sincerity and not as mockery. What are your thoughts? So, what, what does it mean if you're combining a kilt with some sort of a, a costume or a, 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 a thing like that? Sure. The, um, I, I would say, you know, using your, your phrase, the utmost respect, and, you know, not wanting to, you know, have it a mockery. It, it depends on who you ask, just like anything. Like, if you are a staunch traditionalist adhering to, you know, tradition convention, um, anything outside of traditional Highland dress is mockery, almost by definition. Right. If you are coming at it from an angle of, this is just a fun fashion thing, I'm not doing it for any particular heritage reason, then it's all fair game. So, and then there's a huge sliding scale in between. Are the traditionalists going to think you are mocking them? It's your, your, how dare you do this with their sacred Highland dress? Yeah, they're going to feel like that. Um, are they, are on the other end of the scale, are they saying like, you know, you guys are too uptight and da, 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 and I'm going to do what I want? Sure. It, which one's right? Don't know. There is no right or wrong answer. There's your answer. Um, for us, I'm, I, I would lean more one direction than the other. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't do anything that I thought was mocking. I wouldn't do anything that I thought was tasteless, um, with Highland dress. Um, but I would, I would incorporate it into my daily life, but I wouldn't necessarily incorporate it into a costume outside of like a great kilt. Um, so when I go to Flyers games, I will wear my Flyers jersey with my Broad Street Bully tartan, you know, see you right there, copyright right there. <laughs> uh, the, uh, but I'll, I'll wear or sterling orange or like a, a tartan that matches my flyers Jersey. A lot of sports people, you know, sports fans do that kind of thing or enough. Um, at the other end, I wouldn't try to be like a, I wouldn't personally try to be like a, a Highland samurai, you know, type thing, but that's me. I would draw a line there. Do I think that person is doing something horrible and you know, they should burn in hell? No, it's, it's what they want to do. So as long as it's not hurting somebody, fine. Is it watering it down? Is it playing at the culture? Is it making it into a caricature? You can make the argument yes. You can make the argument no. Eric? Very political answer of you. Thank you. <laughs> um, there may or may not be pictures of me on the internet as a kilted Sith Lord. Um, so, yeah, I mean... Yeah, I've done it, but it's for it's for a specific context. Like we often say, context is king. Insert graphic here. Um, I don't have a problem with kilts as part of a for fun cosplay, but in a way, I've been in that culture all my life, you know. So to me, it comes off as normal. Um, would I wear costume elements with a kilt going out in on a regular basis? No. Would I go to a Highland Games or a uh, or something like that uh, in you know a a Jedi robe and a kilt? Hell no. 
Um, I, you know, I, I've, I've seen some weird things at festivals, I will admit, you know, but, uh, and there is sometimes people who like to blend, um, Highland dress with fantasy, especially like, um, I've seen, I've seen elf ears on people who are otherwise in like some kind of fantasy LARPing kind of gear going around at a regular Highland games, as opposed to a LARP, um, or a costume party. And it's kind of like, come on, man. I mean, <coughs> I, I will say they add color. It's kind of part of the landscape at this point. It's kind of like it's for fun, and it's a little bit of the 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 spectrum of things. And I kind of I kind of almost enjoy it because it's become part of the the background. But would I choose to do it? No, I don't think it's I don't think it's uh, correct. And it's just like there are some days when you wear a tie and somewhere some days where you don't. There are some days where you make sure you're looking properly dressed, and there are some days where you you don't worry about it. You know, you don't wear the same thing on a date that you do going to uh, I don't know a wedding. Yep. The, my, the other my thing metaphors I'll, are leaving me, but, you know. The other thing I'll point out is <clears throat> the, there seems to be, and I've, I've kind of, I've felt a pull on certain things years and years and years ago, and I'm going to kind of bring it around to something that's kind of starting to, to bubble up to the surface. And the, the cosplay thing kind of fits into it a little bit. Um, when you spend a certain amount of money, over a certain amount of money, on a kilt or on or on historical garb or on anything at some point you kind of think okay well if i spent you know 500 bucks on this kilt or if i spent you know 100 dollars on this you know this style of shirt you know insert style here um you want to get your money's worth out of it so you kind of try to figure out ways there's there's a pull at you to want to incorporate it into your everyday wear mm. and i've thought of that for a long time like you know when am I ever going to wear this thing again? And then you just kind of find them kind of make up excuses to wear the thing because you feel guilty because you spent so much money on it. And that's kind of, in my opinion, where the whole history bounding Comic-Con, like in, incorporating things into your daily life is kind of coming from, is people spending inordinate, inordinate amounts of money on stuff that they think is fun or cool. They wear it to an event. They feel like they're having a good time at the event and they figure, eh, why stop there? Why just wear it to that event? I should wear it other places as well. And then they kind of incorporate it into their daily wear. And that's kind of where the, the movement of, you know, history bounding and things like that. In my mind, if I had to guess, that's where it kind of is coming from. Mac, Eric, do either of you have an opinion on that? Mac, from your, your experience as a reenactor, do you ever like want to wear out your, you know, your, your GI, you know, 1942 <laughs> GI jacket? with your kilt or out into the world if you're shoveling snow or whatever. <laughs> I mean, I incorporate that stuff out in different times. Like I'll wear my I'll, I'll wear my M, my uh M43 uh jacket out every now and then just to get some wear in into it. And just so that way when I go to an event, I'm not this is not brand new. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there would have been stuff issued brand new, but I want to have some sort of wear to it. Um, but a lot of the stuff, like I'm not wearing my PO8 web gear walking around town. <laughs> right. Like certain things, maybe I'll wear here and there just to break them in to get some wear into them. Like I know guys who have worn, um, rough outs, the, uh, GI boots mowing the lawn just to, again, to get some wear into them. So they're, they're yeah. doing it yeah. in for a reason. For a reason, yeah. not yeah. necessarily yeah. wearing it to wear it. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm but, not I'm not necessarily talking about that. It, although mm. that is a very, very interesting kind of side angle to it. Um, I'm thinking more along the lines of do you ever say like, you know, okay, I'm gonna wear this, you know, this military, you know, radar style beanie from MASH, or you're gonna wear this military sweater or you know, these wool pants that you got for reenactment just because it fits the day or it fits an aesthetic that you're going for or something like that. Have you ever felt that that draw, or am I nuts? Those may be two separate questions. For me, I don't. I I'd say no, not okay. really. There's not really, even like even the time periods I've done, like <clears throat> certain time periods aren't gonna look. It's gonna look odd. You don't very break out odd. your tricorn hat. And yeah, <laughs> like if you know wearing you know uh, breech uh, you know revor breeches out somewhere. It's Certain things can be integrated, like shirts and and sweaters, but and they can be fine, and, and they'll blend in well, or maybe not necessarily blend in well. They'll stand out, but 
for me, no, if I'm going to wear it, I'm either wearing it to an event or at an event, or okay. I'm wearing it just to break it in more. Eric, do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. Um, I totally get where Max coming from with the, you know, you're, you're just, you're breaking in gear. It's yeah. the same thing as like, you know, dragging something behind your car for a day to get some, you know, get some scuff and some dirt on it and stuff. But, um, no, I think you, you guys are both forgetting about the sex. Um, most of the time when I've seen, uh, kilts added to cosplay, it's been, uh, a combination of either a wanting to change it up a little bit. For the for the heck of it, for fun, um, just to be different, you know, just to go out, you know, do a mashup, get outside the box a little bit, or it's because you're playing into the sex appeal of the kilt. So you know, what's better than a super? What's better than Captain America? Captain America in a kilt, you know? Yeah. You know what's what's better than you know the stormtroopers? Uh, I don't know. I don't. You know, it's like. But, but All them I, sexy stormtroopers. Right, exactly. But uh, some people apparently do find that sexy. I've seen some stuff. But the uh, but you see what I mean. It's basically it's it's the it's trying to it's the kilt is like a talisman, and it's like if you add it to your to your your costume, then you have the power of the kilt behind yes. you, and you, you are mightier as a cosplayer. This is the quickening. Yeah. Yes! And it, it's just fun. It's either it's either to get more attention. Or it's because you just want to change it up, um, or or you want to make it a sexy kind of a thing. I think. Yeah, and I think we're coming at it. We're we're coming at it from two different angles, or mm -hmm. coming at it from from um, like I would I would view going to a, a Comic Con or as as the same thing as going to an event. Like yeah, yeah. I it would be very similar in that aspect. Mm -hmm. So, um, to just walk around like. Like maybe going to Gettysburg and walking around there in full uniform would be very similar. Mm -hmm. Like that's mm -hmm. where I, where we would compare more as I hit the mic. Um, yeah, or I could see like to that to that example, I could see like if you're going to Gettysburg or something like that and wearing a kepi, just so that if another mm -hmm. reenactor is there, you're flying the flag and you're like, oh hey, that's somebody who I might want to talk to. Yeah. Um, and and sometimes people will wear a tartan kilt for that purpose because they want to fly the flag so they can get. The attention of people who might know what it is and have a conversation, have a connection with people, um, and I think that happens in the that happens in the cosplay and the 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 con scene also. Um, you know, it's 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 partly that as well. Um, but yeah, the the reasons why people add kilts to cosplay these days are are myriad. But I think it originally started as let's take the power and the confidence and the sexiness of a kilt and add it to something we already think is awesome. But uh, again. It's a special occasion. It's the context that matters, you know. Yep, hundred yeah. percent. I don't have a problem with it. Yeah. Halloween costumes. <clears throat> yeah, I think make keep it fantasy or keep it loosely historical. Um, you know, uh, but don't don't go out there in your regular. Don't go wearing like your formal Highland wear, you know, like your Prince Charlie out for Halloween. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, if you, I, I would say this: if you do. Expect some potential pushback. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm hearing some heaving from the other room. J Jamie's just dying. It's fine. Okay, fine. <laughs> Jamie's dying. It's fine. The show must go on. Yes. The show must go on, Jamie. Do not, do not die on the control board, please. Oh, uh, get get the blood off the keyboard, will you? <laughs> Courage, Camille. Um, All right. She just ha she just has a, a, a an asthma thing or whatever. It's not it's not contagious. We hope. <laughs> I'm safe. I'm out here. I'm fine. Right. <laughs> is, is this how zombies start? <laughs> right. <laughs> Damn it. The Andromeda tartan. <laughs> uh, zombie kilts. All right. I'll do one. All right. Hope that helps, Mr. Mac. What do we got next? All righty. So we have Matt. Hi, Matt. Let's say he's off to an event. But oh no. Uh oh. His sporn just isn't enough. Are extra belt patches a good option? Backpacks? Mm. Are they fine? What about a messenger bag or satchel to hang that may hang against his pleats? Yeah, what kind of what kind of event does, uh, in he a way it may not matter. He didn't but say, but I'm I'm We're picturing, talking about cargo. Yeah, capacity. he's just he could yeah. be at a festival just carrying a lot of getting yeah. stuff, you know. Yeah. I 
my feelings on this are that a I am a very minimalist type person. I mean, my cell phone has my credit cards with it. I have you know a little money clip and my car key. That is it. That is all I would carry. Um, so that will all easily fit in my sporing. Now, if you feel the 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 urge, the need, the burning desire to bring extra things with you, I would say try to keep it minimal. So yes, a belt pouch would be a good idea. Um, if you need to, like if you're going out with your, your two-year-old kid and you need to carry a bunch of diapers and stuff, mm-hmm. yeah, sure, wear a backpack. You know, form follows function. You need certain things, fine, do it. Where I think it crosses the line is too many different things. I and mean, kilts are not cargo shorts. You are not Batman with the utility belt of 27 different pouches going around you for your, for your batarang and your, your kilt gun. I don't know. I'm making up words. But point is, don't carry too much stuff. Try to minimize the amount of stuff that you are carrying so that you don't have to look <laughs> like Batman in a kilt. Eric. We've, we've done that joke before. Remember, we have, we, have, uh, we have pictures of Jason as, as kilted Batman. We, we, put a, we put two sporns on him and a bunch of belt pouches all the way around his kilt belt and had him run towards the camera. It was great. We actually have video of it. Yeah, yeah I know. Um, context is king. I totally resonate with what you made the point before I did about the if you have a kid. Because back in my uh, early kilting days when I was wearing a utility kilt most of the time, <clears throat> my favorite was the uh, Survival, the original Util Kilts brand Survival Kilt. And I had, you know, I, I, I stuffed those pockets with all kinds of things for the kids. I had, like, snacks, and I had a diaper, and I had, uh, 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 you know, one of those flat packs of wipes and all that kind of stuff. Juice boxes and, yep. I'm ready. <clears throat> you know. <laughs> um, and no joke, it really made a lot of sense. Now, if I wanted to look nice nowadays, I would be more tactical and picky about it. I would say, if you just want to grab and go, I think a shoulder bag is cool. Um, there's a lot of really nice retro design canvas and leather uh, messenger bags and crossbody bags for guys, which actually, yeah, they'll look fine even if you're wearing like tweeds. You know, you look you look like you're you know, uh, you know, early 20th century uh, college student or archaeologist or something. Um, those work fine if you if you're talking about a single set of things that you're worried about having like an over large phone or some other kind of a device you know and you the, the belt pouches are very handy for that i would not worry about a bag or anything bumping against the pleats of your kilt um that is against assuming it's a wool kilt it's not i don't think what you think it's gonna be a problem i i would shorten the bag so that it doesn't bump again like that but, to me is like way too low it's like you're, you're playing your bass guitar with the thing down yeah here. But i also don't i don't think i don't feel like the just the pressure of the bag on the pleats is going to hurt them, though. No, no, I don't think it's going to hurt I think them. That's his question. It's look you know? dumb and get in the way. I would just yeah. shorten the bag strap up. Yeah, and if you're or if you're doing it cross body, it's off on the side anyway. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I would just say you know, it, I I hate sports gear personally. Um. So if you want to look good, I would just avoid something that looks like you know like Adidas, Nike, you know, bright neon colors while you're wearing your, you know, anti kilt track suit. Yeah. Uh, you're a Ned. <laughs> a Ned. A Ned with a kilt. Um, yeah, if, you, if you're wearing a nice hunting sporn, if you're wearing a nice, you know, weathered tartan kilt, you don't want to have, like, a br- bright neon green backpack on. It just kind of looks weird, uh, yeah. in my opinion. But a um, little vintage looking luggage, you know, like that. Any, any of that would work fine, I think. I, w- I would say this. Vintage or, for, for lack of a better term, like, military tactical black, yeah. just so it kind of blends in and you're not really paying attention to it too much. Mm-hmm. Either of those, to me, would be fine. And there's stuff that crosses the line, you know. Yeah. You know, there's 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 a lot of olive drab, military esque, um, tactical stuff out there which could work. Um, yep. Other than that, if it's cooler weather, pockets. You know, a, a decent jacket, like a, you know, better bomber jacket and stuff like that, should have internal pockets and chest pockets and things. So, for time and memoriam, gentlemen have carried objects in their jacket pockets. You know, not necessarily a wallet, even, you know, yep. back in the day. So take advantage of that if the weather permits it. Yes. Yes. I agree. Yep. Cheers. Just not a fisherman's vest or a photographer's vest. <laughs>
You look at what's his face from the Big Lebowski, but in a kilt. <laughs> yes, I, I would say this. That, that could even work depending on the event. If you're going out fishing, sure. If you're going to an event where you need all that stuff, sure. But I would, that would be a last resort. I hate those things. Well. I know they're I, not. They're yeah. not like fashionable. No. So, eh, but, but you'll you'll see guys who try to make it fashionable. It's like it's adventure gear. It's just like, yeah, it doesn't work for me personally. Yeah. No, I agree with that. Yeah. Very good. Hope that helps. All right. Was that you, Eric, or was that Mr. That Mac? Was, uh, that was a Mac. Okay. Mr. Eric. Move it to me, then. All right. Okay. This is a, a, uh, a social context question. Kelly Cooper asked us, what are your opinions on wearing a kilt to an Oktoberfest? I'm fairly new to kilting and a little worried it may be crossing the boundary of some kind. Uh, if it helps the two different, if it helps, the tartans I have are an Irish heritage and a Cooper modern. I don't think the tartan really makes a difference in this case, but <clears throat> is, he, is he committing a faux pas if he wears a kilt to an Oktoberfest? Um, yes, no, and kind of, and maybe. The, uh... I'd vote for you. Exactly. The, uh, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna flip it. If, okay. if you saw somebody... You were at a Celtic festival. Everyone is in kilts, hanging out, cheering for all the knock on stage. Love you, Jamesy. Um, would it look weird for a dude with lederhosen to walk in front of the crowd? Yeah, kind of. Um, but you might think that you'd think that either, depending on how much beer you had, either he got lost on his way to Oktoberfest or he's just celebrating and having fun and doing his thing. Mm -hmm. And you're, you, know, you see him as an individual. Um, I would, you know, then reverse it and say, okay, fine. So if I'm, and keep in mind, I've worn a kilt to Oktoberfest. If you're wearing a kilt out of a situation to another cultural heritage type situation, are you going to get looks? Yes. Are you going to get more looks than just wearing it to the mall? Probably. Um, if you can tie it into the event, maybe you get a little more latitude. So, for instance, I've worn my German heritage kilt to an Oktoberfest. If you have a, you know, half German, half Celtic, or if you're Italian, like half Gaelic, half garlic shirt, um, <laughs> then <laughs> I love that shirt. That's I wish a good I, one. I've never I seen that. I almost wish I was Italian just to be able to wear that. Right. Um, the, uh, but if you wear something else to kind of bridge the gap between the two things that you're trying to do, it, 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 it lets people off the hook mentally. And I say it that way because people are going to look at you and go like, what, what, is, why, who? And you're going to break their brain. But if you wear a, you know, a half German, half Irish or whatever shirt or half German, half Scottish shirt at an Oktoberfest and you're in a kilt, then they're going to go, oh, okay, he's trying to do both. Mm. And they're going to understand. Does that make sense? Yeah, I can dig that. I think I, I would do it like um, certain other, the, 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 uh, the Bavarian uh austrian uh hiking hats those little fedoras yep what are yep, they yep. called there's another name for them isn't there like an alpine hat or whatever sure uh, you can't get much more german than that i know the hat you're talking about yeah like the robin Without... hood looking thing with the long yeah yeah it's just it's, yeah, it's like a fedora but it's got the rope yep yeah yep, and uh i had a music professor in in college who wore one all the freaking time he was about as italian as you can get but he also played accordion so he History always bounty. wore that hat um, and they were like super cool in the fifties. I think he was, you know, he was, he grew up in the fifties, you know what I mean? So, um, so yeah, a little nod like that could go a long way for making sure that you don't come off as like, hey, I'm going to show you guys what this is about. You know, I'm going to be like, oh, I'm going to disrupt your, your, your jam here. Um, you don't want it to come off as like, you're trying to, you know, intentionally... thumb your nose at their culture. Yeah. 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 Thumb your nose is a good way to put it. Yep. Um, but at the same time, I think mostly if I've seen somebody in a, in a, in something that's particularly out of place on purpose at an activity, it's just it's usually a party guy. It's usually somebody who wants to be a center of attention, um, and then not necessarily malicious, but definitely like, "Hey, look at me! Look at me!" So, yep. you know, your mileage may vary, but I would I wouldn't <clears throat> mind doing it, and I could see you doing it. But you're an outgoing person. If he's a shyer person, then he may want to not do that if he's worried about. But again, we're, if we're talking about like an Oktoberfest in like Pennsylvania here or something, or New York or California, 
it's nobody's going to care. Yeah, realistically, no nobody's going to care in this country. Yes, no one's going to care, and I, I could look at it. I, I think of it two ways. One, the, my my neighbor Kurt Kunch, um, wonderful, wonderful guy. He goes to Oktoberfest every single year. The man has lederhosen. He has the full outfit. He just embraces it and he loves it, and it's fun. And I would I would actually love to go with him to an Oktoberfest, and you know, in the same kind of garb, and just you know, go nuts with it, and just have a full on German American experience versus wearing a kilt at least once just to do something completely different and get fully into it. When you're wearing a kilt, you're pushing against what the event is to a degree and showing yourself as an individual. But at the same time, you're it, it's, it's fun in a different way. I don't know. Yeah. I could see doing both and just getting like fully immersing yourself in it one way or the other and just either fully going into it or fully going against it just as a, hey, look at me, I'm different, or I'm going to go all in, I'm German and I'm proud kind of thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it, I think, but I think beyond all that, this is an old saw of mine, it's going to be how you carry yourself. I mean, again, you don't go in there with an attitude. You go in there and if you see somebody in full regalia at this event, you compliment them. If somebody performs and you like the performance, you applaud and you compliment them and you be a booster and you be supportive and friendly and suddenly a lot of sins will be forgiven, you know, even if somebody thinks it's a sin. Yeah. So I, don't be a jerk. And I, I was going to use one of our other phrases, be a good ambassador. Right. And if you're, <clears throat> if you're wearing a kilt, you are ambassador of every man wearing a kilt, period. So yep. if you're going to go to that event, be a good ambassador. Be outgoing and be fun and be happy and be positive and compliment them and be the guy dancing up front, you know, do the whole thing, but be a positive force in the world versus kind of, you know, <laughs> later hosen. Am yeah. I right? At a German event, it's not going to win you any friends. Right. So be just be a good ambassador and don't be a jerk, as Eric said. Right. Now, yeah. if I'm not mishearing, you've basically said you'd be willing to wear later hosen. So if anybody out there has access to later hosen, I challenge you to loan them to us. Oh, I don't so know if I want to I wear another get, man's later hose. Well, I, I don't know where it's going to come from. I'm not going to ask too many questions. Do they do they go commando in later hose? How many how many people want to see Rocky in later hose? Raise your virtual hand right now. Oh, uh, this uh, is your purple sheriff Muir, okay? Fair. Mm -hmm. Hey, hey, I've worn later hose in swim trunks. <laughs> I, <laughs> not the same, dude. I know, not the but same. it's still freaking fun. Okay. Um, All right. Indeed. Mac. Now, what happens if we take it to a different level? Leather kilt with the later hose and top, and the and the pouch flap thing on the front. Yes, you're gonna go that way. You gotta go, go all the way in. Go. Well, you see that we could actually make. Yeah, I mean, I've done photoshops of that, like a later hose and kilt mashup. But I mean, in real life, we can actually craft that. Mm -hmm. So we actually could get him into a kilter hose. Do you still have your leather kilt? My you have a leather kilt? Didn't you? Didn't you have? A you're kidding me. Robert Pell from Our Kilts uh, made me a leather kilt way, way, way back when. No um, shit. No, I do not have it. <laughs> Someone may or may not have outgrown it and, <laughs> and sold it to a biker. <laughs> um, sold it to a biker. No, I actually did. <laughs> dude dude okay, was, wanted a black leather kilt, but I was like, hey, I got this one. You're about this size, and he bought it from me. Um, I'm, there are no pictures of you in this leather kilt. I don't, I don't think there are. I only wore it like three or four times because it was snug when I got it, and I haven't gone back to that weight. Um, <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. I no. I, something's got to happen. There's a lot of virtual hands that have uh, appeared in the in the Facebook or in what? the feed. Of here. course there no are. No one likes me. Don't make me wear <laughs> leather hose. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my minion. Yes. Um, let the mischief prevail. Indeed. I. Hey man, if you put leader hosen on, I will. I I think I think Jim Deaner, our uh, close friend, mm -hmm. uh, has a pair of leader leader hosen. But, There's uh, a store up right. in Oli. It's about yeah. 45 minutes or an hour from us. It's a German store that uh, sells leader hosen and all kinds of German we stuff. We could do a beer try for the show. We could do a pretzel try. Yes, we'll bring in Spaten or das or yeah. Oh my God! <laughs> Indeed, brats. Yes. No, I am like the world's worst German. I do not like <laughs> sauerkraut. It's, uh, 
No. You don't like sauerkraut? Sauerkraut's awesome. No, no, can't do it. Nope, nope, no. Nope, oh, well. Not going to do it. The man will eat haggis, but not sauerkraut. No. Okay. All right, well. Watch this space. Lederhosen mm. coming to a kilt shop <laughs> near you. Maybe for April Fool's. I don't know. All right. The whole show. Okay, we'll do, I think it's we'll over. Do a I whole show on Lederhosen and culture. There you go. <laughs> Welcome to Later Hosen. Culture. I am Rocky. Can uh, I, can I li wear later hose into the office? Oh, uh, this is why we can't have nice things. <laughs> All right. Who was that? That it's was Max turn. It was Max turn. All right. All right. So this comes from Twitch. 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 So we have Wolf asking, uh, I only have an expensive wool family tartan kilt. No, Mac, 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 Mac. He said, I only have an expensive woo. <laughs> There Family Jordan kill it. <laughs> Dad jokes with mm -hmm. the win. Oh. Uh, that he tries to reserve for formal occasions, but he has a rehearsal ceremony and dinner for a wedding. Oh. Um, he is part of the bride and groom, and he's been okayed by the bride and groom to wear, wear the kilt. Um, but the dress code for the events is anything between work casual and shirt and tie. Is wearing this this kilt to rehearsal ceremony and dinner only for overkill, or should he gear it back to just one or the other? I know what I'm going to say. What are you going to say? Sure. Yeah, go for it. Rock out, dude. I would just um, I would just not wear a dress sporn necessarily. If you have yeah. a if you have a different sporn. You know, like a hunting sporn or a day sporn or semi dress. Just don't wear anything with fur, and I think it'll be fine. I think it'll look great. <clears throat> and you're you're showing by dressing up in something that you love and that you look good in. You are showing respect for uh, your host. You know, you're not trying to show anybody up. You're not trying to steal attention in this case. I don't think um, you're showing that you're there to be festive. So I think I yeah. I would actually take it a half step further as recon um if he's wearing yep. it to the the dinner beforehand then he could wear the kilt a little bit more casual and kind of gauge the bride and groom's reaction to make sure that he they don't like look at him like oh, god why did you wear that you know he's taking my attention if they have those kind of like eye rolling moments or oh, okay it's fine john thanks for wearing your kilt john then maybe you don't wear it to the wedding but if they're like dude that's awesome you're wearing a kilt great then wear it to the wedding too. And you don't have to dress the exact same way. That's the beauty of the kilt. It's very, very versatile. Yeah. You can wear a, a polo shirt with your kilt and a pair of, you know, nice pair of shoes, you know, get your, you know, your kilt hose and flashes. Wear it to the rehearsal dinner. Then if they react kindly, they like it. Everyone's excited about it. Wonderful. Then maybe wear a semi dress or a dress born where you're, you know, your tweed jacket and vest or wear an Argyle yeah. jacket and vest to the wedding itself. And, they're half expecting you to, and it's it's just part of the thing that is their celebration. Yeah, totally. I, 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 I think you're fine. I think it does you credit that you're trying to be sensitive about this, and you're trying to be polite and cautious. That is very gentlemanly. Um, but I think I think you're you're actually you're actually going to have a lot of fun if you do this. And uh, I think the the former of your statements about if they do the eye roll thing, I, that's highly highly unlikely. More likely, people are going to be like, "Oh, I love the kilt. Are you going to wear that tomorrow? Cool." Um, now, you might be a little concerned if you only have worn the kilt for formal occasions. Maybe you're a little concerned you don't have the the accessories for dressing down. Um, shirt, tie, sweater vest, good to go. Yeah, um, you don't and, need to do much different, honestly. And it also gives you a chance in an informal setting, like the rehearsal dinner. When, when the bride and groom are going to be walking around, they're going to be you know, schmoozing with everybody and talking and celebrating a little bit. You you have a chance to say to them like, you know, oh, I was a little bit you know nervous about wearing my kilt. And if they say like, if you're giving them a chance to kind of you know politely say how they feel about it in a more casual setting than the day of showing up and risking it, um, some people will have the opinion of you know. Consequences be damned. I will wear what I want to wear. I don't care if they like it or don't like it. Don't care. You invite me. I'm going to wear the kilt because I want to wear the kilt. Your opinion doesn't matter. Um, other people will want to be a little bit more nuanced or want to have, you know, that, I don't want to say permission, but that, you know, acceptance at least 
before they wear it to the event. So if you are the type of person who wants more approval or tacit approval, or at least, you know, the nod of, yeah, yeah, it looks fine, um, then maybe, yes, wear it to the rehearsal as well as the thing itself. Yeah. Indeed. There is, there is no greater tact than dress, to quote the Pelham's maxims. I'll, I'll have uh, Jamie insert the, the appropriate one here. There. All right. I think it's my turn now. Sure. Okay. Eric, why don't you talk? Hey. So, uh, yeah, Mr. Rager, if I... Just one more question. Just one uh, more question. One more question. Um, DMC Bigfoot uh, wrote saying, I was born a Henderson. My biological father was a Henderson, and my <coughs> mother was a Campbell. However, both of them gave me up for adoption at the age of three. My mother passed on before I knew I was adopted. My adoptive dad is a Cunningham. I'm kind of torn as to what to wear. Okay. Okay, so he's <clears throat> a, a dynamic family situation. Yeah. Um, your, your, your family is who you want your family to be, to some degree. Um, if you never knew your mom and never knew your dad... Even though they are blood related, if you feel a a pull, for lack of a better term, or a hole that you want to, you know, you want that in your life as well, I would not say, you know, don't wear Henderson or don't wear Campbell. Um, however, what was the Eric? What did you say the uh, adoptive father was? Uh, adoptive father is uh, Cunningham. Cunningham. So if your adoptive father is a Cunningham, in in my mind. He's the one who raised you. He's the one who didn't... It, it, I'm going to sound harsh. He wasn't stuck with you as a parent. You weren't his. He chose you. He brought you into his life. He brought you into his family. So if it were me, that is probably the one that I would feel the closest affinity to. If you're thinking about, you know, what tartan to wear, and you're actually, you know... You're, you're thinking thoughtfully about it. It's not just a, yeah, yeah, I'll pick that one. It's you want it to mean something. What I would say is this. I would actually go to your step, or not your stepfather, excuse me, go to your father, your adopted father, and explain to him where you're at with it and say, look, you know, I know I'm a Henderson through blood. I know I'm Campbell through blood. But you, sir, are the one who adopted me. You are the one that raised me. You are the one that taught me to be the man that I am. And I would love if I would wear the Cunningham Tartan to honor you and your family and this family that we have together and explain to him what it means to him or what it means to you. And to some degree, ask his permission to bring him into the decision because that simple discussion will mean more to him as your father than anything else you could pick. So that's what I would say. Good night, folks. Eric, do you have any thoughts? I don't, I mean, I can't improve on what you said. Not that I'm trying to. <laughs> uh, no, I think that that's bottom line is, um, I don't know if it's oversharing or not, but I am, I am in, I'm in a pagan community. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> we have a lot of people who come to, our community uh, on a spiritual path where they have been burnt, uh, where they've been hurt or have been at least unfulfilled, to put it very mildly, um, by their past, by their family, um, and they have a rift. And part of what they're doing when they come to us is looking for that you know, new direction, that family by choice the as connection. opposed to family by, by blood. Yeah, family by intention. Um, and that's kind of a, uh, well, a new, a new path forward. Um, and so the, uh, the way the story is being described here, in a sense, it doesn't ring unfamiliar to me. I, I'm familiar with that paradigm. It's complicated. It can feel emotionally extremely complicated um, because of the dy dynamics involved, because of your knowledge of where you came from or, or you know, where your, where your genetic path was, you know, but um, as opposed to the reality that you live in. And so 
let yourself have the freedom to explore as you need to. Um, if you feel a pull to where the other tartans, to where the Henderson tartan um, or the Campbell tartan, um, it, if you feel bad feelings towards your parents because they gave you up for adoption, remember this doesn't have to just be about them. It's about a line of hundreds and hundreds of people going back in history. So if you want to consider those tartans because it is a way of emotionally connecting with a long past as opposed to an immediate past, you should feel free to do that too. Um, there, there's, there's a number of different ways to look at it. The trick, I think, is to make sure that you feel like you are fulfilling a need for yourself in the process. That, that by choosing to wear a garment, which seems like a really simple and almost surface-level trivial thing, right? Um, it can be a tool for self-examination. It could be a tool for growth. It can be a tool for um, forgiveness. It's weird to say, but you know, from a, from a philosophical and spiritual standpoint, something that's very simple like that can actually be very, very powerful and very effective and it'll benefit you in the future. So I think you could honestly do both, you know? I mean, there, there's, there's advantages to both. I think that, I think that what you said is more important. Um, I think, but, uh, I think there is some value to acknowledging the deeper roots, uh, as well as, you know, as well as yeah. the, the current life. No, you know I, mean? I agree. Yeah. It's a hundred percent. I agree. Um, Yes, and I, I love your, your thought on you're not just talking about your parents, you're talking about your entire lineage, and, you know, hundreds of years, how you, without all of those people existing, you wouldn't be here. Right. Um, so you're acknowledging both your historic past as well as your, your current past and your current situation with your, your individual, you know, father. So, no, yeah. I, you, there is room for both, um, but that, that open honest, you know, like heart stringy type discussion. Um, as, as weird as it sounds, <clears throat> the, I think it would, the reason I'm, I'm, I would push you to do it and have that discussion is because in a weird way, you're giving him a gift, period. It's, you're giving him acknowledgement of the job that he's done, the sacrifices he's made, who he is as your father, you're acknowledging that in, in a world where those types of things go unacknowledged for most men or most women. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a way to connect with him on a completely different level and give him a gift, an emotional gift that he is going to take with him to the grave. Hopefully he doesn't die soon, yeah. but <laughs> he will carry with him the rest of his life. The yeah. better way of saying it. Yeah, no, I think there, there's, there's, I guess, I guess that the, there's opportunities here. Yeah. Um, don't, don't feel nervous about it, and don't get down on yourself about any of it. Yeah. You know, be, be confident and with whatever bigger, choice you make. And the bigger picture is, don't wait until somebody is dying or dead to tell them how you feel about them. Right. While they are here, while they are in front of you, while you can hug them and kiss them, tell them now that you love them and what they mean to you because that means more and you won't reg you will never regret doing that but you will regret not doing it. Mm -hmm. That's all I have to say about that. All right, Mr. Mac, we well, are at the halfway point. Yes, of say well, the show. everyone grabs some tissues and re <laughs> recollects themselves here. I think it's uh, time for the the ambassador. Very good. Bruce Dull lives happily with his wife, Harriet, outside of Baltimore, Maryland. Bruce is roughly three-quarters German, but he says he prefers the kilt over lederhosen, scotch over warm beer, and the melody of bagpipes echoing in the hills over the oompa music of a stuffy beer hall. Though Irvine is his primary clan, Bruce is also active with Clan McBean, Clan MacDonald, Clan Hay, and Clan Keith, all names that appear in his family line. Bruce got into all this stuff at an early age. His mother started researching their Scottish heritage back in the early 1970s. As a kid, Bruce remembers attending the Fair Hill Colonial Highland Games in Maryland, and he showed an interest back then in the kilt very early, and he started saving money for his own. But mom beat him to the punch and got him one for Christmas one year. You can't tell where you're going unless you know where you've been. 
My Scottish heritage and generations of forefathers guide my way. I know my ancestors are watching what I do with the name. I carry my family name forward. And being a Scot, well, you can't be prouder. My heritage is who I am. Bruce's kilt collection is up to five now, including the U.S. Navy tartan. Following family tradition, he joined the Navy in 1978 and served until 1995. He was on active duty during Desert Storm. After the Navy, Bruce found a career in law enforcement. He's retired now. His last job was working as an investigator for the Maryland Governor's Office of Crime Control and Prevention. So, Bruce has done a lot with his time, including Civil War reenactment and 40 years in scouting. But his greatest passion was the result of his service in the Navy. You see, Bruce is the founder and current commander of post-1814 of the Scottish American Military Society. That means he's usually on the run, organizing events like dinners, banquets, parades, color guard evolutions, and educational seminars. Now, in case you don't know, the SAMS is a 501c19 veteran service organization. SAMS basically tries to be welcoming to anyone who's interested, regardless of where, when, or how they served. They set up at Celtic festivals where they meet, greet, and listen to the stories of veterans. Post-1814 is all about supporting and honoring vets through programs like Reads Across America, Quilts of Valor, and the President's Volunteer Service Award, so I don't blame Bruce for saying there's nothing you can't love about that. The SAMS mission also includes educating the public regarding Scottish and American military history, culture, and traditions. The goal basically being to help Americans understand the contribution of Celtic peoples to the country. Sounds good to me. Now, if you are curious about SAMS yourself, we do have some links down in the description and we'll be doing another video on them in the very near future. In the meantime, if you want to meet Bruce, you'll find him at the Central Maryland Celtic Festival, the St. Andrews Society of Baltimore, or the Maryland Irish Festival. And as usual, you can say hi to him on the Kills and Culture Facebook group. And that is Bruce. In a very, very tiny nutshell, because actually he gave me uh, a huge, huge amount of information, which I could not squeeze into what we normally do for an ambassador segment. Um, very dedicated man, very involved, and very passionate about his community, supporting veterans, and really anything that he's involved in. Um, I wish I could have done more with him, but I'm definitely gonna I'm gonna write him and encourage him to use all the notes he sent me to make an article for himself, <laughs> because his story is pretty cool. Um, and yes, we will be doing another video on the SAMS in the near future. I'm hoping to get it out around Veterans Day. Um, it seems like a really awesome organization. Uh, and Bruce will tell you all about it. If you want to ping him on the Kilton Culture Facebook group, he will give you all the information you'd ever want, and then some, by his own admission, uh, about how to get involved in it. So, Nice. Yep. So, cheers to Bruce. Bruce and all the Sam's members. Bancha. All right, Mr. Mack, what do we got next? All righty. So we have uh, Ian, and I think this is <clears throat> something that a lot of people battle with. Uh, his question is, how best to protect kilts from moths, carpet beetles, and other little fabric eaters? Carpet beetles? I've never he, heard of he, carpet yeah. beetles. That was one he added in there. They're <laughs> fabric eaters. They, okay. No, no, no. Ah, you bloody <laughs> fabric eaters. <laughs> Damn carpet beetle. You wee little blighters. It sounds like a, like a slur. You're, You're right. Carpet beetles over there. Yeah, or, or, like, or like a euphemism for your kids. And like rug rats, you know, car you know, carpet beetles. Goddamn carpet beetles, get out of here! I like that. Go do your chores. <clears throat> um, the couple different ways. Um, one, uh, you know, I hang, you know, lavender or uh, uh, cedar chips in with the kilts in the closet. Um, you can hang them in cedar closets. You can fold your kilt or roll it up and put it in a cedar chest. Um, I would say. Make sure you're dry cleaning the kilt before you put it away. Don't wear your kilt and then let it dry and then hang it up and then dry clean it before the next event. Wear it, sweating it, you know, go out, party like a rock star, and then dry clean it, then put it away. Um, Eric, any other thoughts? No, I think that's it. Um, dry uh, ventilation as much as possible. Um, do not keep your kilts stuffed in the back of the closet. Like if you're like one of the people who uh, we were talking to earlier, yeah, and you only wear the kilt for special occasions, don't just leave it in the back of the closet until that special occasion comes. Get it out into the light. Get it out into the air. Um, 
you know, for, for a period of time to ventilate it. Uh, yeah, I mean, now, what is your opinion on airtight containers with things like mothballs or cedar or whatever in them? Like a bag. The, like some people store like a wedding gown in a bag. Yeah. Are you in favor of that or against <clears throat> that? The, it, uh, my wife would have a firmer opinion on it than I would. Uh, I know there's like acid-free box things for wedding gowns. Um, yeah. I don't know how I would feel about a a a plastic thing. Mothballs, yeah, they will keep the moths away, but then you're going to stink like friggin' mothballs. Um, right. Exactly. So I would say cedar at least has a nice smell to it. Um, so a cedar trunk or a trunk lined with cedar or put a bunch of cedar chips in bags in the trunk with the stuff. Um, mm. Maybe if you're if you're not going to wear your kilt. You're not going to wear a kilt. Shame on you. But if you're not going to wear your kilt <laughs> that often and you want to put it in like one of those, uh, like the, 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 the bags where you, you suck all the air out with a vacuum and like vacuum sealed bags. Oh, yeah. Vacuum sealed. Maybe yeah, yeah. something like that. Mm -hmm. um, if you're concerned that you found, um, you know, moth larva on a wool garment in your closet, then I would say take A, either take your kilt to the dry cleaners or B, Take your kilts and put them in a freezer and deep freeze them for a few days. Right. That tends to right. kill the larva as well. Yep. That's how I was going to make that point. Yeah. yeah basically, because uh, that, that is, that's a pretty much a lock. You know, we, we've, unfortunately, my wife's hobbies with, uh, uh, you know, fiber arts of various kinds. We've had some adventures with wool moths, and uh, there have been times when our chest freezer has been stuffed with skeins of yarn and garments and medieval clothing that was half made and all kinds of stuff like that. So um, it works. <clears throat> it's kind of an after action thing and you don't want to get to the point where you have to worry like that, have to do that. Um, but yeah, other than that, I think the, the lavender and the cedar, as we always say, make sure the cedar is fresh. If it's too smooth or it's old, it's not going to off gas. Um, so you may want to change it out or sand it so that you still get you get the, the fumes coming off of it yes. the way you're supposed to. Um, but honestly, wear the kilt. Use the kilt. If it's out on a regular basis, your chances of having a problem are much less likely. And I do think that wool, tartan wool, is a little less likely to have <clears throat> issues than, say, uh, an Irish jumper. You know, you still have a lot of lanin and you have a lot of air in the weave. It's a loose weave yarn. You know, loose weave yarn. You know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, those garments tend to get hit first. Um, so keep an eye on all of your wool, you know, because there are other garments in your closet, which might be the canary in the coal mine before your kilt gets damaged. Hopefully. Yeah. The, uh, now I want to see, you know, the, uh, the meme of the guy like this and there's a butterfly going off or whatever. Yeah. Now I want to say like, is this adventures with wool yarn or with wool moths? It sounds like a British cartoon. Sure. Adventures with wool moths <laughs> <clears throat> or Japan animation. Like Teletubbies. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Was that you or Mac? That was a Mac. All right. So, Mr. Eric, next question. All right. Pretty please. Um, McDo Hicks <clears throat> asked, what are your views on wearing the Fillimoor instead of a regular kilt? I've been wearing a Fillimoor for seven years, and I really don't like wearing a regular kilt anymore. He's a true believer. He's, he's, he's found the... Uh, the hidden path. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so Philomore versus Philabeg. Philomore is the you know the the Gaelic or the Gallic for the great kilt or the, yep. the great plaid. The, you know, basically the big blankety thing you you know wrap yourself up in around the shoulders. There's more um, of it. <clears throat> Philabeg or the little kilt or the half kilt is you know essentially evolved into what we wear today, which is a tailored garment. Um, so what are the thoughts on wearing the great kilt? every day versus the half kilt or regular tailored kilt every day. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm torn on it. It's, it's weird. We've, you know, back to the, the history bounding or the, you know, the, the costumey incorporated into life discussion or the evolution of clothing discussion or the evolution of individualism type discussion. The, a great kilt can be worn as everyday clothing to varying degrees of success. Um, there are people like uh, uh, the the band Kinfolk 
um, from uh, uh, North Carolina, I think they are, or South Carolina, um, or Jonathan Kennedy, who's a guy in our Facebook group, they wear the great kilt as part of contemporary clothing. They'll wear like a t-shirt or a button-down shirt or a sweater or something with a great kilt, and they will make it work. So they'll kind of mix historical looking garb with, you know, with contemporary garb, with, you know, clothing of today. And they kind of make it work. So there's, but again, to varying degrees of success, I've seen guys wearing a great kilt and it just looks like a dog's dinner, you know, when they try to wear sneakers with it and, you know, the, the tank top. Uh, um, so it's, it can be done. Would I do it? No, I'm not a big fan of the great kilt from an aspect of, takes more effort to get dressed, frankly speaking. I am a very like low, low key, low energy, well, as far as dress kind of guy <laughs> where I don't put a ton of effort into it, but I want to look reasonably well put together and smart looking uh, where that would take more effort, more time, more thought into an outfit for me. Eric, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't have a, I don't have a problem with it. I think, I think it's, I think it's fine. It's uh, it's kind of cool that we live at a time where you have the option. Um, it's pretty badass, uh, and I've seen a lot of pictures now because it's become more and more popular uh, of guys doing it. Like I've seen, we have one fellow who works in a <coughs> warehouse, and he sent us some pictures of him, you know, working on the floor, uh, wearing a great kilt. And uh, I've seen guys, you know, the the people you mentioned are performers, so it kind of works if you're a performer because it's like a hey, you know, it's it's almost costumey. Um, and then there's, of course, Jonathan Kennedy, um, our favorite model, but the, but the, uh, you can absolutely do it. I just don't think you can do it for anything formal. I think that as soon as you try to add, and we've said this before, as soon as you try to add something that's angular, like formal wear is, um, it just looks awkward. Um, I would not try to pair it with, a a, a, a suit fitted type jacket. So an Argyle, a tweed jacket for the most part, a, uh, you know, Prince Charlie, anything like that. I really don't think a great kilt looks good with those garments because it's the floofy combined with the angular of a tailored thing. It doesn't work. Um, yeah. In my opinion, I really dislike it. But now for casual or even, you know, date night level, you know, like if you're going to just rock it with a, with a, a, a wool jumper or with a uh, t-shirt and necklace or, you know, the, uh, you know, like you said, like a dress shirt, but an open dress shirt, no tie, um, maybe a vest you could get away with. So anything up to anything that's like casual cool, I think you're fine. Um, but if you're going to a wedding or you know you have to present an award at your college, I don't. <laughs> you like that one, Jamie? Um, I I don't think it's a good option. Yeah, I would use the words. I wouldn't say necessarily angular. I would say um, clean lines. Yeah, and, and, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Sharp yeah. clean lines of a of a of a tailored garment right. mixed with. The floofy, I do like floofy. The mix with the floofy, puffy kind of great kilt that's kind of free flowing, and then you know very you know sharp lines. Right, yeah. I agree. Yeah, I think that's I think that's basically it. So go for it. Just Indeed, not all, not every occasion. Try it and see if you like it. Um, yeah, and I would also well no, check, sorry, he's already trying it and liking it. So yeah, he's then sure. Yeah, seven then, years is pretty cool. That's enjoy. that's about as long as it's been a a thing. He's like right at the ground floor, you know what I mean? Yep. Says I think I, I think of most people who've gotten into <clears throat> wearing a Philomore on a regular basis. It's more like four or five years at the most. So seven. It's like wow, he's an early adopter. So yeah, right on. He found cool. what he loves and he's going for it. So yeah, man. Cheers to you. Yep. Mr. Mac. <clears throat> All right. So we have Mike asking. What is our opinion on custom 3D printed accessories with a kilt such as kilt pins, skin dues, etc. for casual wear? Um, so he didn't make the note of casual wear in this. Um, he's just gotten into kilts and is learning the bagpipes as well. So, Cool. Sure. Wait, 3D printed bagpipes? No, no. <coughs> he's, he's saying 3D printed uh, just the accessories. Um, 3D kilt printed kilt pin... I could absolutely see. Um, and you can either paint it or use enameling to kind of highlight certain things. Um, it depends on uh, what what material, what kind of pla what the plastic looks like when it is printed. Does it look gray and matte and dull? 
or does it look, you know, can you paint it and, you know, can you give it a, a black metallic kind of look or a shiny chromish kind of look? Mm-hmm. So I would say just printing, I would have to continue and do more things with. Yeah. Um, the, one, the one thing, here's a random thought. The one thing that bothers me about 3D printing is when somebody does a 3D printing of a thing and then leaves it printed without, like, sanding it. Oh, if, if yeah. you have like the lines that you can see or little ridges in the thing that is 3D printed, take some 220 grit sandpaper, just give it a light brush down the side, make it all blend together. It's going to make a world of difference. Please, for the love of God, 3D printers, do a better job. <laughs> um, I don't know why I'm attacking 3D printers, but yeah, hey, it. my son's a 3D printer. What the heck are you saying? Nice. How dare he? Well, um, it's in school, the class in school, actually. No, my kid's going to have that class as well. Yeah. Um, but I would say, uh, uh, kilt pins, 100%. Maybe an embellishment for a sporin, sure, have mm-hmm. at it. Mm-hmm. A buckle, it, mm, good luck. Probably won't work. I would be concerned that it would not, anything that's structural, like the buckle, I would be concerned that it wouldn't right. hold over time or it would kind of snap because ultimately it is plastic. Um, a cap badge would be fine. Um, a plate brooch, maybe? But you'd have to get like a big honk and pin to glue onto the back of it. Kilt pin, yes, sure, that'd be great. Eric, no, thoughts? same. Basically, I would say um, be careful about whatever metal pieces you're going to attach the plastic to as your substrate. I mean, any, any of the things we talked about, you got to have some kind of a mechanical attachment, um, a pin in most cases. So make sure you have a good quality piece for that. But it sounds like it could be a lot of fun. And if you want to do something as... Uh, a light touch or again getting back to the cosplay thing that we sometimes talk about if you're trying to do something that's on theme for a special occasion that could be a blast um but it's gonna it's not going to stand stand up to a lot of abuse um you want to make sure that however it's attached to your garment it's attached well, well what, i what, guess what he was saying and i think i read in, in some of the other comments um, he was using magnets as the backing sure. for okay. for a pin. Yeah, for the yeah, pin. Yeah, a lot, a lot of people, a lot of people are doing that now. Yeah. The, and he sure. did did correct me. He did print the pipes. So that's awesome. So, um, that's awesome if but, they work. Yeah. Now so a couple other people saying about using the three D printing to help um, make a, a resin for casting. For mm-hmm. then you could mm-hmm. you know go yes. that way with it. Use yes. it in a different direction. Good point. Good point, guys. Yep. No, 3D printing, you know, it, you know, I would say mark my words, but it's already been marked, and I've been saying it for a long time. 3D printing is changing the the casting process, is changing specific industries. It's disrupting the hell out of things. Things that used to take <laughs> much longer and much more of an investment are shortcutted a thousandfold by being able to do a three-dimensional model and 3D print an object. Um Frankly speaking, that's how several kilt pins from some of our manufacturers make theirs as they make 3D printed molds of stuff. And that is why I kind of went on my little tear about sanding the stuff lightly because when they, I've gotten kilt pins where they've uh, 3D printed the mold and then it goes over to the master and then when they cast the thing in the production mold, you still see the little tiny ridges of where Mm -hmm. the 3D printer went back Mm -hmm. and forth. And it's Mm -hmm. like, guys, just take five minutes and sand it lightly, and all that goes away, and it looks perfect, versus this kind of, like, weird linear texture to the side of the yeah. thing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, there's there's amazing things you can do with resin these yep. days. Casting, uh, home casting stuff, it's amazing. So, Great. yeah, have fun with it. Why not? Um, yeah, absolutely. I, my brain went to, like, uh, if you did, like, a Rob Roy-style sporin, and you could, like, 3D print um, some cool toggles for the ties, like little gargoyle heads or something, yeah. that'd be awesome. Gargoyle heads, specifically gargoyle heads. Because why not? You know, I, well, you know why I said that? Because of Jillian's, uh, uh, the key fob she has on her Chatelaine. She actually made okay. a little gargoyle face. The back is her key fob for getting into the building. But the front is a is a right. uh, a clay uh, gargoyle face that she made. Nice. It just has it hanging there on her Chatelaine. You know, it's, it's very cute. Nice. So. I was going to say little Nessies on there or something. There little, you go. Scottish monsters. Or Haggai. In, in yes, him. indeed. Wild Haggai. Wild Haggai. Yes. Yeah. All right, cheers. Hope yeah. that helps, kind of. Go for of. it. Send us pictures. Yes. If you like if you like how something turns out, by all means, send us a picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, share yeah, it in yeah. the group. Go to Facebook. Go to the Kilts and Culture Facebook group and share the photos of all the stuff you're creating. Yep. 
Indeed. Yep. All right. Here that was Mac, Mr. Eric. All right. This is a this is a deep one. I think we're recovered from the last emotional question. You can handle this though. Uh, Wayne McCauley. Wayne McCauley asked us. Does Rocky drink Folgers, or does he just drink, or does he actually drink a nice quality coffee? What must he think of me? <laughs> My God, he, he must think I'm like six foot eight and in the army or something. Who the hell One would of those drink wacky Folgers? Tennesseans. That swill. <laughs> no one that I know, or at least would respect, Kirk Kinnaman, would drink Folgers. Um, <laughs> The, uh, no, the, the coffee that we get at the shop is the uh, Green Mountain Coffee, whatever the Keurig stuff is. Um, I, I did, believe it or not, I've done a lot of research on the best Keurig-type coffees. I know coffee aficionados, baristas are going to come at me. Come at me, bro. Um, about, you know, it's come not as brew. good as this kind of... Blah, blah, blah. Don't care. I'm in an office. I want to make one cup of coffee and go back to my office. So, my favorite was the Kenya AA... And if Keurig or Green Mountain Coffee see this, how dare you discontinue the highest rated and my favorite coffee? We had to settle for Colombian and then what are the other two, Mac? Nantucket and uh, Vermont. 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 Yeah. 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 They're, they're, they're good. A, a good mid roast, a good, good medium roast. Um, yeah, it, it's a good pick me up in the morning, not too light, not too dark. It's, it's got a good smooth, Chocolatey, good mouthfeel, good flavor. They all taste yes. the same. <laughs> Pretty much. Now I will, I will, uh, I'll throw out a challenge now to Kirk and Wayne. That if you really think you know instant coffees, have you ever drunk brew? B R U. Hmm. You ever heard of it? No, I have never heard of brew. That's Indian. It is an Indian instant coffee made with chicory. Okay. It is very strong, very intense. <clears throat> it's meant to be made with. Uh, in a lot of cases, all milk, no water, and a lot of sugar, because oh, that I'm all wrong. Cause it, you cause, got my attention right well, now, <laughs> dude. If you like sugar, you gotta get into Indian cuisine because it is the bomb for desserts and stuff. But <clears throat> try brew sometime. You'll put a put a I spring was, in your step. I was gonna go my mom's favorite, which I I now that I this is this is going back to like mid '80s, and now that I'm you know of age to drink coffee and it's not going to stump my growth um, and drink coffee. I don't know what in the hell the woman was thinking. And I love my mother dearly, but boiled water and Sanka, the old instant, just oh. like two teaspoon of the coffee crystal things oh. and put that in there. I'm like, why? Well, isn't that, why? That's like Folgers, isn't it? I it's, mean, it, I don't know. It's, it's like Schlitz brand, beer. Right? What is the point? It's, it's horrible. It might wake you up, but my God, you got to choke it down. Yeah. It's, yeah. no, if I'm going to drink beer, if I'm going to drink coffee, I don't care if it costs a little bit more. I'd rather enjoy the stuff I'm drinking mm -hmm. than like, yeah, you know, want to vomit on every sip. Insert, insert clip from Pulp Fiction here. Mmm. God damn, Jimmy. This some serious gourmet shit. Me and Vincent would have been satisfied with some freeze dried tasters choice, right? Indeed. Damn. <clears throat> okay. So, yes. Not a serious not question. I just picture Folgers in that foil brick. Yeah. That's all yeah. I picture yep. when I think of Folgers. The, 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 the foil the brick. Vacuum yep. pack brick. <laughs> yep. 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 Those are fun, though. Mm -hmm. You ever feel, feel like you just like build something <laughs> yes. out of them? And you just like mm -hmm. stack them up like. It's great know. working in the grocery store. You could do that. Yeah. See, now, if mm -hmm. I was, if I was, you know, a serial killer. <laughs> I'd say we should pack the people who drink Folgers into those sealed bricks. That's harsh, dude. I know. Harsh. Just Kirk Kinnaman, really. Yeah. I love him. I love you, Kirk. Brew. Brew is the only instant coffee beverage worth bothering with. All right, Mac. What do we got out there? And tell me that Kirk is still watching and, and crying now. I, I don't know. He hasn't he hasn't made a comment, so he could be he could be sulking in the corner. Yes, indeed. Um So we have Steve asking. Can you wear a dress sporn without a Prince Charlie? Yeah, you have to go topless, though. <laughs> Just a bow tie. Yeah. <laughs> the Mac Chippendale. Uh, um, would, can you wear a Prince Charlie or a, uh, a dress sporn without a, bow, without, without a bow tie? Can you wear a dress sporn without a Prince Charlie? Um, 
sure, you can wear it with a sheriff mirror. You can wear it with a regimental yeah, doublet. Absolutely. You can wear it with a Kenmore. You can wear it to some degree with an Argyle. If you're, you know, a dress born kind of helps define your outfit as dressy or, or formal. So a an Argyle jacket and vest, you know, probably our most popular style of jacket and vest, the one that we sell the most of, probably two to one over any other style. Um, your your it can be dressed up or down on the scale of formality with, you know, Prince Charlie over here and Tweed, you know, over here, the, the Argyle kind of fits in the middle. It's not fully formal, not really. Um, and it's not really day wear. It kind of is the best of both worlds or, you know, master of none, depending on how you look at it. So now for my wedding, my wife did not like Prince Charlie. She said it looked like a waiter. So I was not allowed to wear a Prince Charlie, and frankly, I didn't really like him either. So I ended up wearing an Argyle with a dress born for my wedding. Um, I think it can work fine. It's just how you carry yourself and how you accessorize the rest of the outfit. And as long as the, I'll, I'll say kind of weirdly, as long as the jacket is black um, or formal, you can wear a, a dress born sans Prince Charlie. Now, I wouldn't wear a dress born with a casual outfit or with you know a, a Highland shirt or that kind of thing. You look like you look like you don't know what you're doing because you're wearing a formal piece of kit with a casual outfit. And that's where you kind of cross the streams and it just doesn't work to me. Eric? Who me? Yeah, yeah. you. you um, no, I agree completely, obviously, because he pays me. No, I do. Actually, I do agree. Um, the uh, the thing is, this is one of those conventions that we feel strongly about, and yet I see people break this rule all the freaking time. Like Unfortunately. It, yeah, like when we were at Celtic Classic, I saw um, several people who were trying to dress nice-ish, but nice casual, and they still had dress born on. I see pictures of Scots doing this, where they have a dress born with a, a casual outfit. You know, no jacket, no vest, um, you know, a dress shirt. Insert Tartan Army photo here. Kinda, yeah. So it's um, I don't know. Maybe we're maybe we're sticks in the mud or something like that. But it just my my sense is that it's it's not it's not a good look. So so would you say, as far as like a button down shirt would be the lowest you would go with that, or would with you a say dress form? with a dress form? I'm just I'm just trying to figure out like the bar we're I, going down. I wouldn't wear it without a jacket. So period, okay. So not like even not with a polo, you're saying no. Oh, oh god, god, no, no. no. I'm it's just, your, I'm just how dare you? I, so. I know what you're doing. <laughs> I, I, I see you over there, pal. <laughs> <laughs> He's making fun of you, Rocky. I can the, tell. He's... No, the it's. Maybe... Oh, did you see what he just said? Oh, Mac, <laughs> how dare you? The such here, gestures. Here's here's where I would go a little off script, where you kind of get into a, a weird gray area. Is if you have a, a, a chocolate bronze or a wood cantle on a dress born, which are like few and far between, but they do exist, mm -hmm. then I could wear it with a tweed jacket and vest. It looks very, very smart with tweed. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't wear a dress born with anything lower than a jacket and vest. It, it looks, would you wear a print, would you wear a, a tuxedo jacket with sneakers? Like, are there people that would? Sure. Should they? No. Should they be drug out in the street, street and shot? Maybe. Um, but it's it's it depends on what you're going for. If you're going for a traditional, you know, a can not. Uh, if you're going for tradition and you're going for you know the things that are traditionally done, it's not traditionally done to wear a dress born with a casual outfit. It just looks off. So that is where we're coming from. We're not. Yeah uber traditionalist by any stretch of the imagination but there are horses for courses you wear you know a casual a day sporin a, a semi dress or a hunting sporin while you are dressed a little more casually like i have yeah. on here imagine me in this outfit right now with a metal cantled dress sporin on it would look off it would be like wearing patent leather shoes with jeans it's just weird overkill it doesn't work i think i think it's overkill that's yeah, kind of what I think. I think now I see. Bear in mind, this is also kind of a modern sensibility. If you look at uh, paintings and photographs from the 19th century up through the early 20th century, you know, Edwardian age, yeah, you'll see guys in in daywear type 
day wear type outfits with a dress, what we would now call a dress sporan, fancy stuff in, in the olden days, which we consider too much now. And even now, I do see pictures of like guys who are at a Highland Games in full tweeds, and they'll still have a fur sporan on. It may not be, it's not going to be like goat hair, um, but... Uh, but it, but they will still have tech, but it's technically a formal dress sporn with a tweed outfit outdoors in the daytime. Whereas I was always taught that basically um, a dress sporn is after six. You know what I mean? So, yep. so what it, you started defining it um, for someone that's new into the the guilting world. Oh, okay. Um, yep. What defines a dress sporn? Sure. There, there are uh, basic classifications of sporn. A day sporn is what I have on here. It is a sideways D shape, full leather, period. A dress sporin is kind of an oval shape, and it has a metal rim or a cantle at the very top of it. Um, it typically is made from fur. Sometimes it's a leather body, but the metal rim, the metal cantle on top is really the defining feature of a dress sporin. You'll also have a semi-dress sporin, which is a leather, it looks, you know, shape-wise like a day sporin, you have a leather flap on the top, but then the body of it is typically made from fur. Another type of sporin you'll run into is called a hunting sporin, which is the oval shape like a dress sporin, but there's no metal cantle. It's just four or, or excuse me, five leather, what are called leaves instead of tassels that are sewn to the front of the sporin and a big old targe in the middle. And the top is leather, just like the sporin itself. Um, those are the basic types of sporins. You also have horse hair or you have like a goat hair or something like that um, as kind of weird offshoots or you'll have a Prince Charlie dress sporin, which is, you know, shaped like this, but it's full fur. Mm -hmm. So there are nuances within it, but the basic, you know, definitions of sporin are day, semi-dress and dress and hunting, I guess it'd be another basic one. Yeah, pretty much in a nutshell. Yep. The cancel was originally the... Uh is the oldest closure system in some way. Well, no, I should say that. Strike that from the record. I didn't say that. Um, it's a very old closure system. Nowadays, it's decorative, and there's a, a leather flap with a snap on the back as the closure. But back in the day, it was a metal uh, hinged opening like on a, a woman's purse. Or a coin purse. Yeah, yep. like a coin purse. So that that's basically why that exists. Um, and it was considered more secure and fancier uh, back in the day and <clears throat> became... I guess now it's kind of a survival. It's all about the looks more than anything else. Yep. But, what actually um, happened was I, 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 I hesitate to quote the date. <clears throat> I think it was, I'll, I'll quote it. I'll go out on a limb. I think it was 1952. There's actually a copyright from W.E. Scott & Son, which is a sporn manufacturer in, in Edinburgh. Um, and they copy or they, they trade, not trademark, whatever. They, they put a patent on a cantle that does not open and close like a coin purse, basically is hinged. If you're looking down the side, it is a hinged thing. There's a little ball on the top and that releases a clasp on the inside and it opens. So when you actually open it, it's a full circle. When you close it, it's, you know, it's just basically a semicircle. Now what it, it was expensive because you're physically forging this hinged thing. And what they did at W Scott was they said, okay, how are we going to get it to look like the same dress born from the front, but cost less just to do the front part, just one half of the cantle to keep costs down. So they, de they designed just the front cantle part. And then they said, okay, we're just going to put a little leather flap that grabs over the back of the back panel and put a snap back there. And you can just flip your thumb to open it up and go forward versus having to actually pull on the ball on the top of the cantle. And that would be what releases the clasp to open the sporin. So they had a, a copyright on that for a while over in the UK. And the, the ball on the top of the cantle serves currently, today, serves zero purpose. But that is a holdover to what it actually used to be was a functional thing to open the top of the cantle or open the top of the sporin. Yep. Yes, that's your little nerd factoid for the day. That's one to grow on. Indeed. Or is it good this way? I don't know. Hopefully they answer the question. Yeah. You know, I would I would almost forgive wearing a full formal outfit without a tie before I would forgive wearing a fancy dress sporn with like 
a polo shirt. Yeah. Get like that that sexy, you know, I'm I'm formal, but I don't have a tie kind of thing going on. It sounds like it the sounds like Sean an outfit that, but <clears throat> it sounds like an outfit to a Scottish romance novel with Fabio on the cover. That's Kinda. how they would dress, Kinda, like yeah. pretending to know what the heck they're talking about, but missing the uh, or got or or um Castle for Christmas. Yes. Remember some of the weirdness in that yes. movie. Hallmark movies. Oh love man, it. this is what we're sure Scott's all dressed like. Please no, just it's stop. romantic. <laughs> oh. I think it's I, I think it's my turn now, right? Sure. Okay. David Ludwig. David, I hope your fencing is going well. By the way, um, had this to say. He said, "I've heard that lower yardage kilts, about four yards worth, uh, with traditional box pleating, can have some practical advantages over uh, equally yardage or higher yardage kilts that use knife pleating." Uh, some of those advantages I've heard include higher wind resistance, broader allowance in being able to be resized or resewn, uh, things like that. So, do you think there's any merit or truth to these? Is a is a four yard box pleated kilt superior <clears throat> in any way to a five or eight yard knife pleated kilt? The I have a love-hate relationship with box pleated kilts. Um, the when I when I first when I made my first one just to play around with it, and I made one for myself. I felt like it was a a cheerleader skirt. I just didn't I didn't like it. Um, I do like for 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 weird reasons. I do like a a lower yardage kilt from a balance perspective because if you take an eight yard kilt. You have one yard of cloth, roughly speaking, one yard of cloth for the front apron, one in one yard for the under apron, one yard for the over apron. Then you have six yards pleated up across the back that, you know, kind of drags down or has more weight in the back than it does the front. In a four yard or a box pleated kilt, you end up with two yards, you know, front apron, under apron, uh, or under apron, front apron in the front, and then two yards in the back. So it's a little bit more balanced. The, the disadvantage is the pleats are nowhere near as deep. Um, and you end up in a box pleated kilt. You're going, you know, the pleat goes, it's kind of a, a Z shape. It goes in on both sides. So the pleat has uh, uh, an edge on both sides of the pleat. It is much more difficult to make. I'm sure Mac is over there cringing and, and crying silently in his beard. <laughs> <clears throat> the, than, a, than a traditional, you know, knife pleated kilt. Because you have to worry about you know ironing on both sides of each individual pleat, the the balance thing I would say is it's an advantage, but it doesn't matter too too much. Um, the advantages are kind of I won't say minuscule, but they're 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 not great. Mm -hmm. um, you could do a five yard knife pleated kilt and a four yard box pleated kilt and have essentially the same advantage. You in a box pleated kilt to, for my money. You don't get the same swing that you do on a knife pleated kilt. So that's one disadvantage for the box pleated kilt. Um, maybe, maybe it's a little bit easier to sit because, because the, the pleats are going both direction. When you back into a chair, it's a little bit easier. You don't have to worry about it mm. quite as much, but I'm, I'm kind of grasping at straws. I don't think there are that many advantages to a box pleated kilt versus a knife pleated kilt. Now, Remake some you, you mentioned in the comment, um, remaking the kilt or letting the kilt out or changing it or something like that. If you're dealing with an eight yard kilt, you actually scallop out all the fabric in the upper portion of the kilt in the fell to make it a little bit thinner in the waistband to be able to sew the whole thing together and sew the waistband on the kilt. In a five yard kilt, because it is less fabric, you don't need five yard knife pleated kilt, you don't need. The, to scallop out all the fabric because there's less material stacked up so you can sew the waistband on without having to worry about that. So a five-yard knife pleated kilt and a, a, and a box pleated kilt, neither of those would be scalloped out. Therefore, either of them would be easier to adjust if you choose to adjust the kilt depending on, adjust the kilt depending on how much you know, weight you gain or lose. Mac, why don't we bring Mac in for this as well? 
see if he has any comments. I don't know. I was just kind of thinking more <clears throat> on the swing. Like, that's, it just, it does, it, it more moves as one chunk, and it doesn't flare. It doesn't have that, that flare like you would on a five-yard or an eight-yarder. Yeah. Um, I kind of get the, where they're meaning about the adjustability, because if you're, it all depends on where that, end measurement starts with because you could be in the middle of that pleat and you would have still have a good chunk to move forward or back if you expanded or contracted so i get that to a little bit of a degree but again i don't think it's nothing he's talking ab about and just for those out yeah. there he's talking about because on a on a box but I'm, I'm assuming this is what you're talking about box but it killed the pleats are about two inches wide so if the front apron wraps around to halfway onto that pleat, you can gain a little bit and move the buckle to be able to show no, none of the under apron versus on a knife plated kilt, it ends, you know, if the pleats are, you know, three quarter to one inch wide, you're, you're, you're not covering up as much. Is that? Yeah, that's yeah. exactly it. it okay. I just, I don't think there's that great of advantage to be like, yep, that's what we need to do. Mm -hmm. I think it's to each his own. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, I think we're kind of in the majority here, if I may. I, I think you, if the advantages were really that good or the ease of care was that good, um, the advantages were that high, you'd see more of them. I don't, I, the, 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 the vast majority of kilts are knife pleated. You know, I would even prefer like a reverse canoe pleating over uh, box pleating, personally. You know, I think you'd have you could theorize it might have similar advantages to some of the, what uh, uh, he's talking about, um, and I honestly I kind of like the look better anyway. But uh, I don't, yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. No sir, that dog won't hunt. No sir, I don't like it. No sir, I don't like it. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's it is both easier for the maker to do a knife pleated kilt, and generally speaking, more popular for a knife. It's Potentially, yeah. it's a, a dog chasing his tail kind of thing or self-fulfilling prophecy where it, because it's easier for the maker, they want to do that one or they're selling more of that one or they're not offering a box pleated kilt, which makes more knife pleated kilts out there in the world. So who knows which is first, but we are kind of not left with, but we are, you know, that is what has emerged as the victor for the most part is knife pleated kilts. Do some people still do box pleated kilts? Sure. Have we made them on occasion? Sure. If you want one, email Ian at usakilts.com. He will <laughs> thank you for emailing him about box pleated kilts. He's going to love me for saying that. Um, hmm. But it's it's one of those where they're not they're not super popular. They do take a little bit more work to do. Therefore, they are generally a little bit more expensive than a traditional knife pleated kilt. Right. Indeed. Mr. Mack. Alrighty. So we have Eric asking, what are our thoughts on a solid, and in this case, he's saying a solid green utility solid. kilt, but I'm going to open it up to thoughts on a solid kilt in general with a flannel shirt or a even a tartan shirt with a solid kilt. Okay. Don't, don't bother me none, <clears throat> personally. So, what are our thoughts on flannel shirts with solid color utility kilts or solid color kilts? Um. I would say there's different horses for different courses. It's the a utility kilt. Let's just let's for the moment, Eric. Let's just talk about utility kilts. Utility kilts are okay. not traditional kilts. Therefore, there aren't conventions, there aren't rules, so to speak, with utility kilts like there are with tartan kilts. Would I ever wear a a flannel shirt or a plaid shirt with a tartan kilt? Hell no. Um, would I wear one with the utility kilt? Sure, because it's it's you're not mixing and matching things. I would probably, if me being matchy matchy, I'd want it to at least tone with the kilt. Um, but it's not. You're not, uh, uh, you know, committing a cardinal sin wearing a flannel shirt with a solid color utility kilt. Eric. Huh? What? Oh, sorry. Um, Wake up. Uh, no, I've done it. I've worn. Uh, I've worn a a black. Shadow tartan kilt, traditional kilt, and I've worn a utility kilt with uh, 
with patterned shirts or um, my favorite is uh, if I have a tartan of a necktie that I haven't shelled out yet for the tartan of the kilt, but I really like it, like Bell of the Borders. I really, I really dig. And there's some Irish tartans I really dig. I haven't gotten the kilt for them yet, so but I can grab a, a necktie and I will pair that tie with a vest or a sweater vest and a black kilt um, so that I get that color pop and I get to enjoy the tartan even though I haven't gotten the, uh, the full, full blown kilt yet. Um, util kilt. It's its own thing. It's like wearing a pair of blue jeans. You could basically do whatever you want with it. Um, and yeah, only one pattern per outfit, you're on safe ground, I think is, is a way to look at it. Yeah. You know, except for that paisley kilt of yours, of course. I mean, you could wear anything with that. Yeah. For the love of God, no. <laughs> paisley shirt and lederhosen. <laughs> Trying to make me vomit? Yes. Yes, I am. All right. Is that you or Mac? That was Mac. All mm -hmm. right, Mr. Eric. We'll do one more from you and one more from Mr. Mac. Okay. Um, maybe I should do a shorter, a shorter one. Da, 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 da. Um, <whistles> oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. We just have we have some good these the questions I have left are like would be longer discussions, so I'm trying to be nice um to you. Uh Scott Kreckman said, other than Ren Fairs and some Celtic festivals, when is an appropriate time to wear a dirk? I have one, but it usually seems like it's a bit extra, or someone might flip out about it being a weapon. I think we've answered this before. But... Yeah. Um Dirks to me are Ceremonial, Ren Faire, or wall hangers. Hard stop. Um, it's either you're wearing it for your wedding, either as part of a, a, a military look or a formal look, or you're just using it to cut the cake, or you're wearing it like a, a staghorn uh, dirk as part of like a, a Ren Faire or a historical garb type look, or just hang it on the wall. Um, there's not, to me today where I don't have to defend myself and ward off ruffians, um, there is little point to carrying a dirk. Specifically dirk, meaning a oh, foot long or so knife you, you have on your belt. Not a ski and do that you wear on your sock, but a dirk, which is the, you know, the dagger that you have on your waist. Eric, what are your thoughts? Yeah, pretty much the same. I would give uh, one smaller, small exception that I know there are a couple of guys out there who are into like traditional primitive uh, bushcrafting or um, primitive hunting will actually have a dirk uh, and a dirk set like you would have in the 19th or 18th century for going out into the wilderness, basically for carving up game um, or as a utility knife. Uh, but that's different from a battle dirk, you know, a, a weapon kind of a thing. That's uh, And that's a very rarefied niche. Um, yeah, for the most part, it's you just, what's the point, you know, basically? Um, although it, the idea of showing up at my local butchers with a dirk and saying, I'll do my own cuts, thank you, is highly amusing to me. But, um, but no, I, you don't, yeah, it's, it's a toy for most people. Let's be honest. I mean, yep. in, in context of the 21st century, it's mostly a toy. Um, it's for looks only. So it's think of it this way. You're going to buy a $500 leather targe. Where are you going to wear your targe? The shield that you would use with a dirk. You're not. It's a wall hanger or it's a costume piece. It is not something that you would wear with traditional, you know, Highland dress, um, you know, for formal type gear or for, even for day wear kind of thing. It is very costumey. Well, so, yeah, yeah, we say this, but, you know, Black Friday is coming up. So I could, there might be some stores I wouldn't mind having a tar just kind of pushing my way through. As long as it has the spike on the outside. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. A retail Go spike. Yes. Black Friday's dead, though. It's fine. Cyber Monday. Right. That's where it's at. <laughs> Not that you would ever have to shop online at your favorite kilt store, USA Kilts. Yeah. You wouldn't want to enjoy com. the convenience of having all the best accessories and full-blown kilt outfits, not to mention gift cards, at, within a, a, a mouse click away. <laughs> Why would you want that? Just a few, a few taps and your shopping is done. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Enough commercial. 
All right, Mr. Mack, <laughs> what do we got for the last question of oh, the day? Oh, and never mind. What do we got for the last question of the day? <laughs> I thought it was, we forgot to do the question of the day. No, you do that at the end. I know, but I don't have a question of the day because it was supposed to be Jamesy. I was going to give it to him. <laughs> He's not here. So now we got to think of a question of the day. Damn All it. Right. All right, Mac, what's your next question? All right, so um, Will wants to know is when are you putting together a bus tour of Scotland? Actually, um, the, do we do we talk about this? Well, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm going to talk about something. Okay. Um, <laughs> All right, I'm, you go first. Okay, I'll go first. Yeah. <laughs> the um, uh, one of our moderators, Robert, is kind of talking about he you know messaged me the other day in our Facebook group and said, hey what would we think about maybe putting a tour of Scotland together or a tour of Ireland or something like that? So I don't know if he put it in the group yet or not. I think he did, but my memory is pretty foggy. Um, so he was actually thinking about maybe putting together a, a tour of Scotland and see who wants to go and kind of open it up like that. Um, would we as a company do it? Probably not. It's, it's a lot of effort and planning and all kinds of stuff. And that's not, what I'm built for. Um, <laughs> there are Irish companies um, that will put together, you know, Irish tours or Scottish tours and things like that. It's not something that I'm trying to you know, make a buck off of, so to speak. Um, it is an interesting concept though. Eric, what was your thing you were going to talk about? Well, I mean, if, if something like that came together, I'd be sorely tempted to join just as a participant. It, it'd be a blast. Now, whether my wife will allow this or not is another question. Um, but, uh, that, that, that could be an amazing experience. No, I was, um, you might hate me for mentioning it, but we were toying with the possibility of USA kilts. Uh, nope, nope. Kilts nope, and not, culture. I was, you let me finish. Kilts and culture with the help and support of the resources we have here at USA kilts. Is that better? Continue. We were thinking about kilts and culture. Um, showing up at the Tartan Day Parade in New York. No, no, no. Not showing up. Jesus Christ. Taking over. Oh, okay. Okay. Everywhere we go, we take over, buddy. Participating in. Yeah. So. It's a concept. It's, it's a an concept. idea. It is a concept. It is a, it is a, we need to do data and research and, and straw polls and Ouija boards, <laughs> whatever else to figure out if it's a good idea. Um. It feels like it's far away, but it isn't. It's going to creep up on us, you know? If only we had a way to do market research on if people would actually care enough to want to go and spend money on a hotel and do all the things yeah. around New York City for Tartan Day. Huh. Hmm. Well, I don't know how we tell people. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, let's figure that out. So, question of the day. <laughs> if... K and C, Kilts and Culture, USA Kilts. If Eric and I and a bunch of videographers decided to descend upon and take over New York City and enter a bannery thing and march in the uh, Tartan Day Parade up New York City, um, would you guys care? Would you guys spend money? Not, not to. Not, we're not trying to make money on it. Would you spend money to go get a hotel in New York City and do the thing? Should we do a meetup? And I want you to answer honestly with your wallet, not your, not your heart. Don't tell me, yeah, I'd love to go. Yeah. If we say, hey, this, you know, April, you know, it, Tartan Day is April 6th. So it's good, the parade's going to be sometime around there. Right. If we said, do you want to go, would you spend your hard-earned dollars to get a hotel in New York City and do the thing just to be in the Tartan Day Parade or nah? It's, it's too much effort, too much time, too much uh, uh, right. travel, whatever. Tell us in the comments. Realistic. Exactly. Give yeah. us your realistic, actual answer, not your heart answer. Because my heart wants to go every freaking year. Yeah. My wallet, my wife do not want me to go every single year. So let us know if you would go if we did it. Please let us know. Very good. Until next time, boys and girls, thank you for watching and... Bonjour. Bonjour. So this is what I've been looking at the entire time. Since Eric was in the other room, I drew a little smiley face and put it on the wall here, and I'm pretending to look at Eric. 
This is what Eric looks like in my brain. 